Hey, hey, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great. It's great to be here today. Uh, I really appreciate that welcome. Uh, it was nearly 50 years ago when President John F. Kennedy gave a challenge to our nation. The challenge was to send humans to the moon and return them safely to the earth. Upon issuing this challenge, engineers and scientists from around our country uh, got called up and they got engaged in this challenge. They built rockets 36 stories tall. They built engines more powerful than anything we've ever built before. They sent heroes on a journey farther from the earth than they'd ever been before and actually farther than we've ever been since. By developing the technologies of their time and fusing that with their, their own creativity, their own innovation, these engineers and science, scientists defined what we now call rocket science. They accomplished President Kennedy's goal, but they accomplished much more. By, by going to the moon and returning humans safely, the United States became a technology leader. These, these engineers and scientists had a lasting impact on our economic security, on our national security, on the, geopol the geopolitical landscape of our time. Now, when we went to the moon, we did so in competition. We were competing with the Soviet Union back in the 1960s. And that competition was called the space race. Now, I have, uh, I have a confession to make. I'm NASA's chief scientist. I'm a rocket scientist. And this confession is painful for me. But I'm going to tell you, I don't remember the Apollo program. I wish I could. I really wish I could remember it. I was too young. I was four years old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I think I should be able to remember, but I don't. And when I look around NASA today, and I look around the aerospace industry, there's a whole generation of talented engineers and scientists just like me who know about the Apollo missions, not from our personal experiences, but from the history books. And so what I think about a lot is I think, what is our generation's space race? What's that large goal? What are the objectives that are going to serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills as they did back in the 60s? Uh, you know, I think about this a lot, and as many of you know, I'm, I'm also a faculty member at Georgia Tech. And I'll tell you, at Georgia Tech, I'm surrounded, as, as we are at all of our nation's universities, by a lot of young excited engineers and scientists. And, and there's nothing like being around these people on a daily basis. Do you know why people go into engineering and science today? They want to change the world. You go into engineering because you believe in technology and you know that through technology, you yourself may have a chance to change the world. And these students that I've worked with for a number of years, they have big dreams for our space program. I teach a class, it's called Introduction to Aerospace Engineering, and in this class we share our dreams about visions of the future. And so what I want to do now is I want to share with you not the students' list, but my list. Uh, I have a personal list uh, of game-changing possibilities for our civil space program. In fact, there are nine things shown here. There are nine things, nine items, that I believe that with the proper technology investment, we as a society could accomplish in my lifetime. And that's actually what keeps me going. This is what gets me up in the morning, and this is what I'm thinking about at night. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine being able to identify life on another planet, or Earth-like planets around other stars. Imagine not going just to the moon, but sending human explorers off into deep space to explore asteroids, and one day to explore Mars. Imagine being able to forecast major natural disasters here on the Earth or storms and save people's lives by moving them out of danger. These are the things that through investment in technology and innovation that our space program can do today. Now this isn't NASA's list, this is my list. And what I hope is that many of you in the audience have a list just like this. Now what I want to do is zoom in on one particular challenge. And that's maybe the grandest challenge that I can think of, which is the idea of one day having humans walk on the surface of Mars. This is a challenge that I know a little something about, a little something about. 
I've actually worked on robotic missions where we've sent very small spacecraft. Uh, I worked on a mission called Mars Pathfinder where we sent uh, the Sojourner rover, it was about this big, to the surface of Mars. That was a huge challenge. But it pales in comparison to what I'm talking to you about today. We're not, for, for Mars Pathfinder, we sent something about this size. We've since sent larger missions. We've sent tabletop rovers to the surface of Mars. There's two of them still in operation today. And in 2012, NASA plans to send a small car-sized rover called the Mars Science Laboratory to the surface of Mars. And as great as that is, it's 1,000 kilograms. It's one metric ton. As great as that is, to send humans to Mars, we don't need to send a small car. We need to send a two-story house. In fact, we need to land a two-story house right next to another two-story house that was landed autonomously ahead of time and has all the fuel and supplies for those human explorers. It's, it's a base camp already set up, ready for them. In fact, what this image shows on the bottom is it shows those two-story two houses next to each other. And then on the right, I've superimposed the lunar excursion module that took those heroes to the surface of the moon. The largest lander we've ever made. The largest lander humankind has ever made. And look, even it pales in comparison to what we need to send humans to Mars. The challenges of landing systems this large are great. We have to invent new technologies. We have to land on the surface in a way different than we do today for our robotic missions. And this is one of the reasons why aerospace engineers and some policy analysts have looked at this challenge and said, Humans to Mars is a bridge too far. Another way to look at this challenge is in terms of the mass requirements. What I have on this slide is the mass required uh, not on the ground, but in low Earth orbit. Right? So we send all this mass up through with launch vehicles, we assemble the mass in low Earth orbit, and we then send our human explorers to Mars. Uh, and what I've shown on this slide is the mass requirements, if we just take the technologies that we have in hand today, and we go off and try this human Mars mission. It's shown in kilograms, okay, but maybe another way of thinking about that, these uh, four and a half million kilograms, is in terms of vehicles. We would need seven very large cargo missions and one human mission to put these explorers down on the surface of Mars with our existing technologies. In terms of things you might know about, that's 12 international space stations of mass. Now you may know that it's taken us over a decade to assemble one International Space Station in this same place, in low Earth orbit. Here I am talking about 12 International Space Stations. Obviously, I must be crazy, right? The, uh, the Saturn V launch vehicle that got us to the moon, the largest, most powerful launch vehicle this nation has ever produced. It would take 37 Saturn V launches to lift the mass that I'm showing for this mission. Well, how are we going to do this mission? Uh, clearly, we can't do it with our existing technology. And so what we need to do is start making investments. And these technology investments will, over time, they'll bite off pieces of the mass required. Uh, a single technology can make a big difference. But no single advance will get us all the way down to where we need to be to make this mission feasible. In fact, what we really need to invest in is a series of technology advances. Make multiple investments across Many disciplines, structures, propulsion, uh, life support, radiation protection, all of these things are required to make a human Mars mission feasible. And what I'm showing on this slide is that with the proper technology investment strategy, we can bring those, those mass requirements down to something right around, within spitting distance of what we've already accomplished. One or two international space stations of mass. And with a heavy lift launch vehicle, that is something that is feasible. That is something that we can't do today, but with technology investment is within our grasp. Now, how do I know these technology investments will pan out? Uh, in the introduction, it was mentioned that I've worked on some Mars missions. In fact, the mission that I've worked on the most uh, was Mars Pathfinder. I worked on that right here uh, from my office in Hampton, Virginia, uh, from 1992 to 1997, from the start of that mission to the, to the flight itself. Mars Pathfinder was made possible through investments in technology. We did this mission in an entirely different way than we had ever landed on Mars previously. We did something called direct entry. We utilized airbags to cushion the lander when it reached the ground. Uh, the airbags are often referred to as these beach ball 
type device that allowed the rover to bounce and roll to a stop. Many of you may remember that technology. Without those technologies, this mission was not, would not have been possible. And on top of that, without Mars Pathfinder, which truly was a pathfinder for the way we do space science, we wouldn't have done a whole host of other small missions, missions to asteroids, mission to, missions to comets, sample return missions from across our solar system. Mars Pathfinder actually led to the creation of the Mars program that we had today. Prior to Mars Pathfinder, we were just talking about going to Mars. There was no Mars program. There wasn't a group of scientists and engineers focused every day on sending things to Mars. This shows how technology investment can change the way we do business at NASA. And we need to make more of these kinds of investments. Now, in April of this year, the president, President Obama, gave a major space policy speech in Florida where he talked about a bold new era of space exploration, an era not focused on the next destination, but focused on investments in technology and innovation that focused on the capabilities required for us to be a space-faring society. This is something that, as a university professor uh, and as a researcher, that I resonated with immediately. And so I was glad to come join NASA, as were many other people, by this, by this vision. What he was talking about was new ways of doing human exploration, new propulsion systems, new structures, new ways to land on other planets. Um, new radiation protection systems. He also extended the life of the International Space Station. Uh, we were on a course to actually deorbit the station, the station. We spent over a decade and much of our national treasure constructing this national laboratory. In this next decade, we're going to fully utilize the station, both for science and as a unique test bed for our technology development experiments. Hopefully tomorrow, R2, along with a crew of human explorers, will launch on the space shuttle. R2 is a robot developed jointly by NASA and GM. And as R2 is on the space station helping our human explorers, in GM plants around this country over the next few years, you're going to see robots popping up in the factories, helping, uh, helping our factory workers and helping our automobile industry be more economically competitive. On the station itself, we prove out technologies. Uh, in the upper uh, image here on the right, we have a water recycling facility. You can imagine that water is a valuable resource in space. It's precious. And what we want to do is be able to reclaim and recycle every bit of water for our proper uses. This is a technology that has implications in, for space exploration, but clearly across the Earth, particularly in the arid regions of the Earth, water recycling is, is extremely important. Here's a space-age technology that has down-to-earth applications. For our science missions, we also have a number of advancements. Think about the next observatories, not the ones that are flying today, the grand observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope, but think about our search for Earth-like planets and the advances we need to make there, or think about our missions to the outer planets and in-space transportation systems that we need to advance. There are lots of ways to actually go about these missions, but they all require investments in technology to make them work. Now, we, we invest in technology for our space program because it allows us, it enables new missions in science, aeronautics, and exploration. But these same investments help us every day on the Earth. In 2000, I worked on another Mars lander. Uh, the lander actually never flew, but there was an instrument on that lander designed by a principal investigator at Arizona State University. That principal investigator, after that mission was canceled, took his technology and started a company in California. The company's named Bloom Energy. Some of you may have heard of it. At Bloom Energy today, they're producing fuel cell devices, shown in the upper left of this image, that are producing energy uh, very, very efficiently, very cleanly, and they're actually, these devices are popping up all over Silicon Valley. Uh, he's able to produce electricity cheaper than it can be bought on the electric grid. We've made NASA's space technology investments have helped us in transportation whether we're talking about our ground transportation or our air transportation. Uh, just this year, NASA's used its remote sensing platforms to track hurricanes, uh, in, 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 to use that same remote sensing technique to help people in relief efforts in Haiti. And our biomedical expertise 
that comes from the International Space Station and the pursuit of sending humans out into space for long durations uh, helped folks in Chile when we had the minor disaster where they were trapped beneath the surface. Structural engineers provided requirements for the systems shown here that helped, that helped us bring those miners back to the surface. Whether we realize it or not, space technology is pervasive in our society. It's GPS on your phones or in your cars. Biomedical advances like blood pressure monitoring systems, pacemakers, artificial hearts, even LASIK eye surgery all come from space. The protective armor that we give our police, firefighters, that we, uh, our military personnel utilize comes from space, comes from our investments in space technology. So we invest in technology to enable our future missions of science, aeronautics, and, and exploration. But we had also invest in the same technology for our pursuits here on the Earth. And so when I think about that question, what is the space race of our generation? It's really the same as it's always been. It's not about dates and destinations. It's about the cause. It's about technological leadership and what that allows us as a nation to do. Technological, technological leadership and the economic competitiveness advantages, the geopolitical advantages, and the everyday society advantages of that leadership position. That's why we invest in technology. My students have taught me a few things. My students at Georgia Tech. One of the things that they've taught me is the importance of going to school, in inventing technology, building the future, and changing the world. They believe they can. I believe we can. In fact, when I think about NASA and the space race back in the 1960s, that's what the space race was all about. I mean, yes, we achieved our goals. We sent human heroes to the surface of the moon and returned them safely. But it was about so much more than that. That's what our space program was created for, and that's what our space program can still do for us today. Thank you for your attention.